Welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here. Welcome to those listening online. Just one announcement here to highlight this morning. If you are planning to serve in the nursery, or if you would like to consider serving in the nursery. So if you're a member and would like to serve in the nursery, we're going to have a short meeting afterwards in the nursery. So immediately following the service, for those interested in serving in the nursery, we'll have a meeting. If you've been visiting in our church, or even if this is your first time, and you are interested in knowing about our church, we have a new to Haven Heights class beginning next Sunday. So we're going to meet in the front conference room. So to the left of where you come in that front door, there's a conference room. Anyone is welcome to attend this, even if you've been a member for a long time, and you just want to know about that. And, and just because you come... It doesn't mean that you have to become a member. Anyone who's interested in knowing more about the church is welcome to attend. Let us now take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The word of our God. Would you please stand with me? Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden flowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own. His faithful flower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine, content whatever lot I see. Since tis thy hand that leadeth me, he leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, for by His faithful follower I would be, 
for by his hand he leadeth me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. You may be seated. At Haven Heights, we give 16% of our um, giving and contribution, 16% of that goes to support missions outside of the church. This morning, we have a representative from one of those missions that Haven Heights supports. So we have a representative from Gideon's International. Leroy Martinez is with us this morning. And Leroy is this close to being family. So he is my brother's father-in-law. So he's here with us this day to share about Gideon's International. My God is good. My God is good. My God is good. It's time to go out into the streets and minister. Psalms 27, 14. Wait for the Lord, be courageous, and let your heart be strong. Wait for the Lord. That is what was said at a men's gathering in a gym. There were many questions in how to, what to, and whom to minister to. But a man had prayed for days asking God for an answer to be led the correct way to minister. Onto the streets, his prayer was answered. For a good reason, he went back to the school again and he brought it up with the men that he was with before. And when he asked them that the answer was to be to go out to the streets, the men heard this and started to groan and saying, I don't know about that. Are you sure? Following week, that man went to a park and took some basketballs a Gatorade container of water, and of course his Bible. For three weeks, no one, of course, no one showed up, and even his wife asked that he no longer go, and it saddened her to see her husband come home saying nobody was in the park. The word of this came to the ears of a Gideon. Praying with this man and sharing a scripture, one came to heart. Psalms 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be courageous and let your heart be strong. Wait for the Lord. On the fourth week, that man again went to the park. This time, he saw three men playing basketball at the courts, picking up his Gatorade container filled with water and his basketballs and his Bible. 
He walked, to the, he walked to them, walking on the court. He boldly asked if he could pray for them. The three men took a couple steps backwards and said, you want to pray for us? This man said, yes. And the men kept on staring at the new basketballs. Can we play with those new basketballs? The man said, if I can pray with you. The ministry today has grown to be a great outreach from three men to as many as 200 plus men, women, and teens from different churches and unchurched gathering together. And the man who had the basketball container filled with water, and of course his Bible is now a Gideon. And I am now going on that 14th year as that Gideon. Share God's word, change lives. These few words really sum up what the Gideon's International is all about. For more than 100 years, Gideon and people in congregations like yours who support us have been sharing God's word and helping changing lives all around the world. Last year alone, the Gideons distributed more than 75 million scriptures in places others cannot go or will not go. These places include hotels, motels, prisons, schools, and colleges. We also provide New Testaments for the police, fire, and medical personnel, especially our armed forces in the Middle East and around the world. Presently, Gideons serve the Lord in more than 200 countries, 99 languages, often in very difficult places. But Gideons are no special are not special, we're just like you. We are born again members of local churches as business and professional men in communities like yours. We simply want to make sure everyone has a chance to receive the good word and the opportunity to know him as Lord and Savior. A young man has spent prison time since 16 years of age now 36 years old, he wanted to know the good news. He was told when he was in prison, you see, he was placed in a cell alone called a hole or solitary confinement. Of all the books that were available to him in the library, a prisoner threw him a Bible, reading from front to back, saying he didn't know Jesus or what God was saying. A Gideon took time to share the words of God and explain what it would give him peace, and most of all, freedom. Today, with God's grace, he is free with Jesus in his life. So you might ask yourself, how can I help? What can I do to put God's word into the hands of millions of people around the world? Your daily prayers for the worldwide ministry of the Gideons are vital to our ability to continue to put the word of God into the hands of the lost and dying world. There's another great, exciting way you can put God's words into the hands and pay tribute to someone close to you. We have get cards that are available for you to send out to different people for health, condolences, and many other things. These are many different ways to express yourself. Growing up in Denver, Colorado, two younger brothers, four sisters, and a mom and dad I lived in a government housing project. Most of us might know it, but being Latino with a last name like Mar Martinez, we used to call them the casitas. And as an adult, I was an alcoholic. At a time of possible end of my life, you see, they gave me less than one year to live if I did not stop. While I was in the hospital for a total of 30 days, a Gideon came to me, and I told him to leave the room multiple times in the most foul way. And can you believe this? That Gideon kept on coming back day after day after day to tell me that, there was a, that he was a Gideon and has good news for me. So I decided to listen. This Gideon invited me to church. I met a new family, and I was baptized. This, this Gideon is my teacher in Christ and also my mentor. His name is John Wilson from Archibald, Ohio. To imagine that a Gideon wanted me to join other Gideons at CCNO and prison ministry. I spent my time running away from CCNO and prison ministries. And then a Gideon came to me 
and invited me to join him at juvenile detention center. What? Nine years and enjoying going to jail. As a coach, as a Gideon, as a cross country coach and a track coach, and as a Gideon, a triathlete, I'm a long distance runner, fellowship a Christian athlete bo uh, board member, juvenile detention center, CCNO, Bill Class Prison Ministry, a speaker for the Alcoholic Anonymous. I share this with you as a Gideon, but I also share this with many of my athletes and many of the students that I get involved with. Philippians 2, 1 through 5, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. I thank you for the opportunity to share about the worldwide ministry of the Gideons International Congregation. Thank you for your attention. It's been a privilege to participate in your worship service. But before I go, I'd like to say this. As a coach, I want you to remember this. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Now that you heard it, everybody in the locker rooms. Amen. Thank you, Leroy. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you this morning for Leroy Martinez. We thank you for his passion to make you known among the nations. We thank you for the work of Gideon's International. Father, we pray that the scriptures handed out would make many wise unto salvation. Father, we pray that you would illuminate minds and open eyes and open hearts. We pray that the word of truth would become for many the word of life. Father, we pray this hour that we might be strengthened in your gospel as we gather together. Father, we thank you that Jesus has done it all. We thank you that Jesus lived the perfect life only to die for our sins. And we thank you that he is not dead, but is now ruling and reigning in the heavens. And we thank you that he sent his spirit to live inside of his own, to guide us into truth and to ensure that we will never fall away. And so, Father, we pray that you would keep us. And we pray that we would continue in your work. We pray that we would bear much fruit through your church. In your mercy, we pray that you would lead us towards greater depths of love and obedience. And, Father, this hour we confess that even this past week we have not always and loving or obedient. We confess that we've taken delight in others' hardships and trials. We confess that we have been unkind, cold, and indifferent. We confess that we have thought our ways are better than your ways. And we confess that our actions have violated your law. Father, if we are honest, we confess that we have sinned against you. And this hour, we thank you that you are the God who is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Father, we take comfort and assurance in your promise to forgive and cleanse the sins of the one who asks. We pray for those who are in difficulty this morning. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those who are hurting, and we pray that you would draw near to those in need. We specifically pray for Henry, Sharon's grandson, and in your mercy, we pray that you would guide these doctors as they make plans, and in your mercy, we pray that you would provide full and complete healing. We pray for our tithes and offerings, 
And we pray that you would use them, that the gospel may ring out from this church with clarity and with power. We pray for the preaching of your word. We pray that you would speak. We pray for ears to hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Let's continue our worship. Peace. 
you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Our scripture reading this morning begins in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke. And encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The word of our God.
soul is satisfied in him alone. That's what we just sung. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that that'd be true of our lives. We pray that we'd be satisfied in you alone. Father, we pray for these next moments. And we pray that your word would teach us how to be satisfied in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the most sacred aspects of my duties as a pastor, one of the most sacred things I get to do, is to be with people in their waning moments of life. Oftentimes it's in the final days, even the final hours, that people really and truly reveal their heart. Oftentimes, you can learn more about a person in the days prior to death than you can in the decades leading up to death. Oftentimes, when life is short, life gets real. We return to the book of Acts this morning. The Apostle Paul, after spending years, even decades, in the mission field, the Apostle Paul is now an old man. And in his old age, he's planning to go back home. He's planning to go to Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul, we saw last chapter, is planning to make a direct trip home. But in the province of God, he needs to change ships just outside of Ephesus. And due to this unexpected layover, he has one last opportunity to speak with some local pastors. The Apostle Paul knows that this is his last time he's ever going to see them. The Apostle Paul, in many ways, is like a man on his deathbed. His time is short. It's about to get real. He's about to say his final goodbye and give his final advice. This is where we pick up our study in the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Acts chapter 20. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came to the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that you would find helpful. And I've taught publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. 
Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom of God will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples away after them. So be on guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day, even with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. In Acts chapter 19, the last time the Apostle Paul is in Ephesus, there's a citywide riot. We remember Christianity was sweeping through the city, and Christianity has such an impact that it was changing the culture and the economy in Ephesus. Christianity was changing everything, and not everyone was on board. The city was in turmoil, and some were threatening to kill these Christians, and they're saying, hey, we don't like the new direction of the city. And if we remember, in Acts 19, the riot ends in sort of this stalemate. The leaders tell these Christians, you keep to yourselves and everything will be fine. You keep to yourselves, everything's going to be fine. But if you start telling more people about Jesus, there's going to be problems. That was when Paul left Ephesus. In the province of God, Paul now is 30 miles outside of the city in Miletus. Paul now has a layover, and so he calls for these Ephesian elders, and these Ephesian elders run. They jump at the chance to meet the Apostle Paul. And undoubtedly, they have so many questions. Should we share the gospel with those who want to kill us? Is private Christianity okay? How outspoken do I really need to be? Hey, hey, Paul, we've got many households that are divided. Some worship Jesus, but others in that same household, they worship Artemis. They have so many questions, and they long to hear what the Apostle Paul is going to say to them. But notice in our passage, the Apostle Paul doesn't answer any of those questions. The Apostle Paul simply reveals his heart. For those taking notes this morning, two words to guide our time. Paul bears his heart with number one, an example. That's first example. And then our second word this morning is exhortation. Paul gives an exhortation. So example and exhortation. First example, the Apostle Paul says, as you think about what lies ahead, remember my example. As you think about what lies ahead, remember my example. Verse 18, you know how I lived among you, not for a day, but the whole time I was among you. You know how I lived. You saw my life, and you saw the example I set. On Friday, I counted. I've now done 23 funerals. That's a lot in six years. In 23 funerals, here's what I've noticed. The best funeral message ever preached is a 
godly example. The best funeral message is when people say, I want to be like the one who died. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. I have left you my example. What a great thing as a Christian to strive for. To leave an example that can be copied. Now, before we go any further, I want to talk to the person here today who says, well, I've already blown it. So maybe you're here today and you say, you know, this is the problem. Like, people know my life. And they know how I've lived among them. And there's a lot of stuff in there that I'm not proud of. My life shouldn't be copied. I don't want my kids to copy my life. I don't want the people I work with to copy me. If that's you this morning, there's no reason to despair. There's no reason to despair if we turn to Christ in faith and repentance. You see the guy who says, follow me, follow my example? This is at one time a terrible guy. At one time, the Apostle Paul hated Jesus. The Apostle Paul actually thought that Jesus was dangerous and bad for society. And so he simply went house to house and he drug Christians into prison. And he gave his consent when Christians were murdered. The Apostle Paul is not a great guy in the beginning. But then as we saw in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, he sees Jesus for who he is. And then he repents. And the Apostle Paul goes from someone being against Jesus to being someone for Jesus. And here's the thing with the Apostle Paul. Here is part of his example. He never forgot who he once was. Three times in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, when speaking with people, says, this is who I once was. That's part of his example. I was changed. I met Jesus, and he's changed me forever. That's where any good Christian example must begin. I met Jesus and he changed my life. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying Jesus has so changed my life, so radically altered who I am that I can now say, follow me. He lists out his example in verse 19. He says, you know, I served. I was humble. Tears, I I wept, and I was tested, but I never backed down. You know what those things are? Service, humility, compassion, testing. That's a life that's consistent with the gospel. Paul served the Lord because he knew exactly who Jesus was. Paul understood that Jesus died for his sins. Each of us has received many gifts before for Christmas or for anniversaries or for our birthday. And we all know that the better the gift, the more thankful we are. Paul's service to the Lord is not a drudgery but a delight. Paul's service to the Lord is out of an abundance of gratitude. And those who truly understand the forgiveness of our sins are those who are happy to serve the Lord. Those who understand the forgiveness of our sins really and truly are those who are happy to serve the Lord. Those who know what Jesus has done are happy to serve the Lord anywhere and everywhere. Paul's known for his service. He's known for his humility. True humility comes from one place and only one place. True humility comes from the gospel. Just think of what the gospel of Jesus proclaims. The gospel tells us that Jesus has to die for our sins. And Jesus has to die for our sins because we are utterly incapable of doing anything about our sins. There's nothing we can do with our sin. And so Jesus has to come to us. Like he says in the gospel, you are utterly helpless. And so I have to come and do this for you. Like you can't be a good person. And so Jesus has to come and live the perfect life. He lives the perfect life in our place because we can't. And, and the gospel tells us that, that we're actually enemies towards God, Romans chapter 3. 
In Romans chapter 5, we don't desire God. Like, we don't want anything to do with the one who's going to come and help us. And yet, that's our only hope. And we're opposed to that hope. So even Jesus has to open the eyes of his enemies so that we might see what he's done for us. Ephesians chapter 2. The gospel drives us to humility because in the gospel we see exactly who we are. The gospel proclaims that without Christ we are God-hating sinners incapable of changing. That's who we are without Christ. You know what that message does? It swallows our pride. Service, humility, and tears. Paul was known for his tears. It broke his heart over and over again to see people reject Jesus. You see, the more you know Jesus and who he is and what he has done, the more it hurts when others reject him. Apostle Paul is a man of tears. You see, everywhere he went, people rejected the only God who could save them. And sometimes those who rejected Christ, they took their rejection out on the Apostle Paul. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is in Poseidon, and he's kicked out of the city. Chapter 14, in Iconium, there's a plot to kill him. In chapter 14, again, in Lystra, they stone him, trying to kill him. In chapter 16, he's thrown into prison. And in chapter 17, there's a riot with Paul at the center because they hate him. And then in Athens in 17, the apostle Paul is mocked. They make fun of him. And then in chapter 19 in Ephesus, there's another riot. That is a long list of trouble. He's saying, I was tested. Like, you know what I went through. And yet the apostle Paul never backed down because he knows But the testing of your faith leads to a life that is mature and complete, not lacking anything. The Apostle Paul says something like this, you know, I was tested. But in the end, it only made me a stronger Christian. The Apostle Paul is a man who wanted everyone to know about Jesus. Just look at verse 20 and 21. Paul declared the gospel of Jesus house to house. That is a systematic, intentional effort to share Jesus with everyone. He proclaimed, verse 20, anything that would be helpful. He proclaimed, verse 27, withholding nothing. Paul explained how Jesus makes a difference in every facet of life. House to house. Everyone was told the gospel of Jesus will make a difference in your politics. It will make a difference in your finances. It's going to change your work. It's going to change your family. Everything in your life is going to be affected for the better by the gospel of Jesus. Paul used his words. I want to tell you how Jesus changes everything. But it wasn't only his words. His words were backed by his life. There's a reason that verses 20 and 21 come after 17 through 19. The Apostle Paul says, you know my life. Because you know my life, you know what I told you. Part of the example of the Apostle Paul is this. The gospel will only go forward when others see that it's first impacted us. That's the reality. The gospel will only go forward when others see that it's first impacted us. You want to know if you're impacted by the gospel? You know you're impacted by the gospel this morning if you're willing to be obedient. The Apostle Paul says, hey, I think the Lord's calling me to go to Jerusalem, and I think he wants me to share the gospel there, and I think they're going to put me in prison. And I think it's going to hurt. I think it's going to hurt a lot, but I think the Spirit's calling me to do that, and so I'm going to go. I'm going to be obedient. What a powerful example that is. Apostle Paul is saying, this is real. 
The gospel is so real that everything else is secondary. Obedience and faithfulness to Christ is primary, and every other concern is secondary. And so perhaps we ask the question, why? Why should I do the right thing if it's going to cost me? Why should I do the right thing when I just don't feel like it? Why should I do what the Bible tells me to do when every other person says, that's foolish? That's unwise. Why be obedient? Because the Apostle Paul realizes that in the end, following Jesus is always best. Don't miss what the Apostle Paul says in verse 24. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. And why can the Apostle Paul consider his life worth nothing? Because he says, Jesus has got it covered. The the plan of Jesus is so good, and it always works out in the end, that I don't even need to worry about my life because he worries about it more than I ever could. That's the example of the Apostle Paul. And church, when we live like that, when it's obvious that we are so committed to Christ that everything else is secondary, church, it's in those moments that we will get a hearing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. When it's obvious that we live like that, people will be lining up to say, let me hear about your Jesus. So that's the example of the Apostle Paul. He says, this is who I am. This is how I lived. And you know that. And then he gives his exhortation. Second word this morning, exhortation. Exhortation is a call to action. It's an encouragement to do something. The exhortation of the Apostle Paul is to watch. To be on guard. To watch. Now that's not passive. That's not like Lance watching the Buckeyes on TV. You know where the players do all the work and Lance eats all the snacks. It's not a watch like that. It's a watch like a lifeguard. It's her job to be constantly scanning for trouble. Paul says, watch. Watch yourself and watch your flock. First thing the Apostle Paul is, you need to watch yourself. He says, be on guard, be cautious, watch, because all around you are traps and snares. Church, our enemy is on the loose, and he longs to set a snare for us, and he longs to trip us up, and he longs for us to enter into sin. You know, I used to think that my phone would listen to me. You know, several times Marie and I have been talking about different things like vacations or things we might buy, and sometimes I'll be scrolling through Facebook, and immediately after that conversation, there's a Facebook ad for that. And I began to think, hey, this phone is listening to me. And so I began to look into this. And here's how it works. Artificial intelligence is so good that it can predict what you are interested in before you even are. Artificial intelligence can predict future behaviors. And if a machine can do that, How much more can the prince of the power of the air? The devil knows our habits. And the demons know our desires. And they know the direction we are heading. And they are laying traps and snares along the way. The Apostle Paul says, watch your life. Because that's reality. That's. The reality. And then he says, this is so sober in verse 30. Even from among among your own number, some are going to fall away from the faith. And they're not only going to reject Jesus. They're going to rise up to preach a false gospel. You know how amazing that is? The Apostle Paul tells these dedicated men, The devil is going to get some of you. 
and some of you who are in ministry, and some of you who are right now undergoing persecution, and some of you who have walked 30 miles just to hear what I have to say, and you pastor churches, and you've planted churches, and you love people, some of you are going to reject Jesus. And not only are some of you going to reject Jesus, you are intentionally, purposely going to lead others in a way contrary to Jesus. You're going to fall prey to the devil. And not only are you going to fall by the wayside, you're actually be going to become an advocate for him. I was on a missions trip in college with approximately 80 other students, and I remember the moment that our leader said, in the coming years, not all of you are going to be walking with the Lord. I remember that moment like yesterday. Scott had tears in his eyes. And he intentionally made eye contact with every single one of us. And he says, I am certain that some of you who are on fire for Jesus will soon reject him. And in all of my 20 years of wisdom at that point, I thought, you know, this has to be hyperbole. Like, I understand your point, but really, like, looking at all of us and, and the tears and the whole bit and saying that some of us who are committed are going to fall away, I mean, come on. I thought these are the most committed of the committed. We didn't go home for a vacation. We went on a missions trip. We didn't take internships. We trusted the Lord would provide for our future. We didn't get to see our friends. We trusted the Lord with loneliness. We were college students on fire for Jesus, and he looked us dead in the eye, and he said, some of you are going to reject Jesus. And he was right. From that group, 19 years ago, some are not walking with the Lord. Some of those committed college students live sinful lifestyles. Some have embraced false gospel. And more than one has made it their aim and intentions to lead others away from Jesus. Scott was dead right. So is the Apostle Paul. You must watch yourself. Watch yourself because any of us can slip into the embrace of sinful choices and false teaching. Apostle Paul says, watch yourself, and he says, watch the flock. Now, Paul is talking to pastors in Ephesus. He's saying, you need to watch those under your care. Now, I realize that not everyone here this morning is a pastor. But we all have people under our care. Parents have kids. Grandparents have grandkids. Teachers have students. Captains have players. Work leaders have followers. Nearly all of us have people under our care. And the Apostle Paul says, be on guard with those under your care because, verse 29, savage wolves will come in and will not spare the flock. So sobering, right? Be on guard because there is an active, intentional effort to bring down those you love. We need to have an honest and a sober assessment here. There are forces that are out to bring down our kids and to bring down our church. We must be on guard against that attack. So how do we do that? One of the ways that we start by being on guard is to simply know the points of attack. Any, any good general knows where they are most likely to be attacked. Any good general knows this is where we are vulnerable. If the enemy is going to attack, it's probably going to be here. So we ask, where are those whom we lead? Where are those under our care? Where are we most likely to be attacked? The answer may surprise you. We're most likely to be attacked in 
what makes us happy, what makes us happy, or what makes us hurt. The devil is most likely to attack in one of those two areas, what makes us happy or what makes us hurt. He's going to attack us in what makes us happy. So what makes you happy this morning? Maybe it's security. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's power. Whatever is the source of our happiness, the devil knows it. And he plans to use it against us. And the false teacher will always whisper, I know a better way to get what you want other than the way of Christ. And the idol will always say, I can offer more than Jesus will ever give you. You know, obedience, that's not going to make you happy. Obedience, that's going to make you miserable. But you know what will make you happy? That's my specialty. That's what I sell. Oh, how many people are lured away to their happiness. Be on guard with your happiness. The devil will promise unlimited happiness in efforts to lure us away from Jesus. Know what makes you happy. Know what makes those around you happy because it's a source of attack. Number two, the false teacher will use the hurt. The false teacher will say, you know, Jesus will never heal that. But I know a way of healing and comfort and peace. False teacher will say, what kind of a God is that? Leave you to hurt the way that you are? Let me heal you. Let me show you a better God than Jesus. And oftentimes the devil uses both. His strategy is like this. You know what will make you happy? I can give you what will make you happy. And it looks good. And we give into the temptation. And, and we sin. And then we instantly regret it. And we're overcome with guilt, shame. And we feel terrible about ourselves. And then the devil says, look what you did now. What are you going to do with yourself? Oh, I've got the solution for that too. I've got what will take your mind off of the way that you feel. The devil's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Traps and snares always in front of us. And the Apostle Paul says, be on guard. Watch your life. And watch the lives of those under your care. We must know the points of weakness because this is surely where the devil will attack. And so this morning, we need to be reminded that our only hope is Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus. Our hope isn't in strategies. Our hope isn't in wisdom. Our hope is in Jesus. The Apostle Paul ends his exhortation here. He says, I commit you to God. Like, I can't do anything more for you. And so I commit you to God. And I commit you to the word of his grace. And the Apostle Paul commits these people to God because that is our only hope. Our only hope is Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, he highlights here that Jesus is the God of grace. Jesus is the one who came to us. Jesus is the one who lived for us, and he died for us, and he longs to be with us. And how much does Jesus long to be with you? He says, I will live inside of the believer. And when we understand, like the Apostle Paul, all that Jesus has done for us, there is one response and only one response, and that is to live for him. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we pray that you would show us your grace. Father, we don't mean show us with simply words, but we mean show us with your experience. 
Let us see with the eyes of the heart, with clarity, all that you have done for us in Christ. Let us see afresh this morning your love, your care for us, that you came to us. Let us see your mercy, that you died for us. Your grace, that you paid the penalty for our sins. Rather, let us see that afresh and let us see that with clarity so that we might live for you. And Father, this day we pray that going forward, that each of us would be an example worthy of emulation. And Father, as we have thought about our lives, thought about the example that we're leaving and thought about the points of attack. Father, we pray that if we need to repent, we pray that you would give us the gift of repentance. Cause us to change. Cause us to turn towards you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. going to sing in Christ alone because he is our only hope. This morning, the Spirit prompted you and you've been convinced, I need to repent. I need to change. I want my life to be an example. Don't leave here without doing business with the Lord. And if you would like, I would love to talk with you. Let's sing.
life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Acts 20, verse 17. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. That's how we go forth. That's how the gospel advances. You are dismissed.